at 1 Peter 5, we seek to restore the zeal of our forefathers in the traditionalist movement. And to do so, we promote what we call the godfathers of the trad movement. People like Archbishop Lefebvre, people like Dietrich von Hildebrand, people like Michael Davies. Well, today we talk to perhaps the second generation of traditional uh, godfathers, and that is Dr. John C. Rao. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Rogation Tide, everybody. It's Rogation Monday. Hope you're all processing around your property and you're blessing your crops. Today we have Dr. John C. Rao. Dr. Rao, it's a pleasure and an honor to speak with you once again. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Dr. John C. Rao, if you don't know who he is, I'm sorry that you've been deprived of his work, but today we're going to remedy that. Dr. John C. Rao is the author of many books, of, of which I'm going to show you in a moment. But uh, Dr. Rao has been uh, fighting the traditionalist cause for, what, two decades now? No, since 1970. Three, dec <laughs> uh, three decades? Four decades? I can't do the 1970, so that would be 53 years. So the year 1970. <laughs> Well, how old were you when the Novus Ordo was uh, promulgated upon us in this new spring? Uh, I was 18. I was 18. I mean, the changes started coming in when I was 14, uh, 1965, but the uh, the Novus Ordo as a whole, 1969. Uh, and uh, I remember being rather disgusted by it from the very beginning and then was confirmed in that when I uh, became uh, an early member of the Roman Forum in 1970. Excellent. Well, we're going to talk all about the, that, that history with Dr. Rao. Before we get into that, just want to remind everybody that we are in the middle of our May fundraiser. We do need your support to do what we do at 1 Peter 5. Everything we do is free, but we do have bills to pay and mouths to feed like everybody else. So please donate 1peter5.com slash donate. We really need monthly donors. You can afford $5 a month, $10 a month, anything like that. That helps us plan our income. Uh, long term and all that good stuff. So please donate one peter com slash donate. So Dr. Rao, uh, I don't know where to begin, but first I want to say this is my favorite book of yours, Black Legends and the Light of the World, which I, I'm very happy to find out is you the Aruka Press is now publishing your complete works, right. which is going to be in seven volumes. Follow the link below and buy all of John C's round C John Rao's work. You will you will thank me for buying all these things. Buy them for a priest. Buy the buy seven volumes. So tell us about the seven volume set. I've got the first. We've got the Unrepentant Catholics Cautionary Tale, which is a prelude, and then we've got Volume One is out now. So tell us right. about the 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 complete works uh, plan. Well, what happened was when I was. Uh for all intents and purposes, thrown out of the university. What happened is that as I was planning for what to do in the future, I sent around uh, a list of everything that I had written to people on our mailing list. And then uh, Alex at uh, Aruka Press, uh, looking at this stuff, said, well, I, I'd like to print all of these, but we have to divide them up according to topics. So what we did is we arranged this schema where we had basically counter-revolutionary writings, writings uh, particularly on the problem of Americanism, problems with respect to uh, the old liturgy and the new liturgy, and then uh, immediate issues of various kinds, and then just purely historical matters as well. And I'm, I'm not sure whether the uh, uh, reprinting of the Black Legends is part of that seven-volume series. That might be something separate. Uh, from that. And I'd have to talk to Alex about it. But they're coming out uh, as quickly as the proofreader can deal with them. And uh, the proofreader is uh, uh, an old, old, old friend of mine um, that I, I see every year at the Catholic Identity Conference. And he, as he points out to me, um, has to deal with the fact that sometimes my style uh, requires a little bit of a little bit of extra effort to be able to penetrate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, Dr. Rao, I, I, what I love about your work is that it, it's it was just like what I was mentioning to you before I went on the air, uh, is this um, relentless uh, joy of fighting the good fight, just a, a joy of fighting the good fight. And you, because you've, you've been through, you've waited through all the history to, for 2000 years with your work, 
and then you've also lived the history that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, is there any plan in the Ruka? Uh, I because I haven't read some of your other stuff. Um, besides the 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 concept of the grand coalition of the status quo, right? Uh-huh. Do you do you treat on that concept in other places than in Black Legends? Oh yes, yes, because it's been it's been really a guiding theme for me. Um, I think in that article that I wrote for you about the Roman Forum, I mentioned a number of books which uh, have been really formative for me. And uh, the themes that I utilize in the Black Legend are themes that really I developed out of reading these particular texts that have been shaping me really since I was an undergraduate. And one of them is the um, the great work by Werner Jaeger on, on Greek paideia and then paideia and early Christianity. Um, and then uh, others have been uh, these works that I think I mentioned about the uh, birth of the lay spirit in the uh, in the, uh, the the Middle Ages. Also, uh, the um, the work of Emil Mersch on the whole Christ, the concept of the mystical body throughout history. And then all of these together are what uh, shaped, I would say, certainly by the time I got into the beginnings of the program that we've been running on church history here in New York and then the Gardoni program in Italy, the whole, the whole idea of uh, what I mentioned there with respect to the grand coalition of the, uh, the status quo. Okay. So why don't we start first with what is the grand coalition of the status quo? And then we can talk more about your own history, which would then give us the, the global history of our whole trad movement. So what exactly is this grand coalition of the status quo? Well, this this theme, although the words obviously are not used, but the theme uh, just impressed itself upon me from the beginnings of my reading of Werner Jaeger, um, and then an awareness that the problem that was faced by the Socratics was the problem that then, when Christianity comes onto the scene, is, uh, is what remains at the center of sacred history up until the, the present. And the problem is that the Socratics are saying, and particularly Plato, who explains this in in most detail, what the Socratics are arguing is that even what it is that is good about their whole cultural experience, which is this Greek uh, attempt to try to uh, get possession of what is beautiful, is something that requires, uh, to use Plato's terms, a great detour because you have to step back and judge whether you really understand what you mean when you're talking about what it is that's beautiful. And then in trying to take the step back and seeing that there are problems with uh, immediate perception of what is beautiful and how you gain possession of it, people like Plato, based on Socrates and then developed by Aristotle as well, understand that to see what's beautiful and gain possession of what's beautiful, you have to also know what it is that's good and then ultimately what it is that's true. And this is an extremely obviously difficult enterprise, but it is at the center of doing what it is that you claim you want to do correctly without wasting your entire life. But it's a huge, huge effort. And from the very outset, uh, the enemies of this whole approach and these uh, in terms of uh, the spokesmen for the enemies at large are the people that Plato identifies as the word merchants that uh, we refer to as the sophists. What their whole enterprise is, is to stop you from taking this step backwards in order to be able to judge what it is uh, that uh, is beautiful and how you gain possession of it with reference to these other two themes of the good and the true. Uh, And because what they want you to do is just simply in an unexamined way, plunge into, accept and move forward with what everyone in the tradition up until this point had just taken for granted was obviously beautiful. And that in the whole judgment of of the Socratics uh, means really ultimately just simply divinizing whatever it is that gains you immediate immediate physical desires, immediate wealth, immediate power, immediate fame, um, which is a delusion. Uh, So that what I call the grand coalition of the status quo are all of the various people that really don't want to step back and examine what it is that they do and who are encouraged and led um, in this uh, commitment to the unexamined life by the word merchants, um, the sophists of the ancient world, the media people all through ages, 
uh, various people who are uh, opinion formers who betray what it is that they really ought to do in order to get the immediate fruits of um, of an unexamined uh, existence as well, and who, as Plato say, have a knack, a knack for being able to lead people who don't want to examine business as usual um, and who want to just simply go with the flow of the status quo. Uh, it's all of these who form together a coalition. Uh, and then in moving forward into Christian times, the reason why this grand coalition of the status quo uh, led by whoever the word merchants of the age may be, um, are, are, are more angry with Christianity than they even were with uh, the work of the Socratics, is because the Christians um, have the capability of being able to present their argument um, in a way that is able to popularize it in a fashion that the, the uh, Socratics really found that they could not do with the same kind of verve. They're able to popularize it, and they also have uh, this organization. Um, uh, the or it's, it's it's sad to use the term organization in this respect, but the mystical body of Christ, which overcomes some of the problems that Plato himself identifies in uh, finding out how it is that the individual and the community that both need one another in order to overcome the lack of knowledge about where it is that they should be going in order to gain possession of the beautiful correctly, it overcomes this um, and it enables the chief obstacle for getting that job done. Um, it overcomes that obstacle for good. So it's an infinitely more dangerous enemy and an enemy that then utilizes all of the tools that the Socratics had already developed as well. Um, there's a, a wonderful book on early Christianity uh, by an Italian woman whose name is Marta Sordi. Um, I forget the exact title, Christianity in the, 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 Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, I think it is. It's been translated into English. Uh, and that book gives a nice catalog of the various elements that form this coalition of the status quo. Um, and then that gets added to through the, the, the ages. But um, everybody, everyone who, who has ever dealt with um, the difficulties of trying to awaken people to stepping back and judging what it is that they do, it, it can add perhaps his own uh, categories of people who form part of this group. Yeah, this reminds me of of one of my friends who a uh, convert to Catholicism, who who one of one of the proofs of Catholicism for him was the fact that he would look at all sorts of different sectors of society and religions that were all disagree with each other, really, on basic right. fundamentals, but they all disagreed on one thing, and that's that they hate the Roman Catholic Church. And, <laughs> and, he, and then he thought, wow, that's you know, that seems kind of uh, interesting. And it, 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 I mean, it, it certainly seems that like this this historical proof that one can see that there is a grand coalition of status quo seem to indicate that there is really a fall, a, a conspiracy of the fallen angels. And they're just, they're just right. pulling these puppets, these various puppets, like we've got the globalists today and we've got all sorts of different enemies within the church, all these different people. And the demons are just puppet, the, puppeteering all these different uh, coalition members. Um, so how, tell us about, take us back in the history. Tell us about, um, it, because as I was saying to you before, there's, um, among the, uh, the old guard trads like yourself, Dr. Rao, uh, Michael, Matt, I was talking to him about this among the, uh, older generation of trads that we, we might, we might identify the, the so the first generation who is already dead and gone, gone laid right. to the, laid to rest. And then we have the, the second generation uh, people who took up people who were just coming of age, like yourself, when this whole thing happened, um, right. who took up that same crusade that people like Dietrich von Hildebrand were were taking up as adults and professionals when it happened. And then we have sort of the third generation, like myself, who are taking up the traditional cause now. And it does seem that the uh, younger generation is the one that's uh, the the least hopeful, if you will, uh, you know, because now we're in. We're now we're in the age of traditionus custodis, and uh, oh, should I even be Roman Catholic at all? I mean, people are asking questions like this. God forbid, they're even questioning their their Catholic their faith in the Roman Catholic Church, um, and it's very sad because people like yourself, you've already been through right. a whole lot worse, really, 1970s. So, can you take us a little bit? Uh, take us a little bit down 
memory lane and and tell us about what it was like growing up as a traditionalist or a little bit about how did you get involved in the traditional movement? Well, I got involved. I mean, I was aware there was a problem. Um, I had always I had grown up in a family that was always uh, politically conservative. And as a consequence, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of instilled the idea that there was something wrong. There was something wrong the way things were going. But they uh, took church matters for granted. I mean, and even into the in, into the time of the council, you just just took the church for granted. It was there and then it did what it was supposed to do. And then when it started not doing what it was supposed to do, it was very, very difficult for people, like say for my parents' generation, to believe that there actually could be happening what was happening around you. Um, but but I would see it uh, very, very uh, clear. I saw it very clearly in any number of immediate ways. For example, uh, I, I, I grew up just outside of New York City in New Jersey, and I was in a town where uh, there was no Catholic school. Uh, to go to, but almost the entire population was Catholic. Almost the entire population was Catholic. There were there were some Jews who were around. We we barely knew what a Protestant was, uh, but all of us went to the CCD program, and I was confirmed in the old right, and we continued on uh, going to the CCD program uh, into uh, into uh, the first high school year. But what was interesting was that. The changeover in 1965, by the time the council was over, the changeover was immediate and very disturbing, not just to me, but a lot of my contemporaries, uh, many of whom uh, have no interest in what it is that I'm doing in this regard now. But I remember going back to CCD. I was my, it was, I was a freshman in high school. And uh, once again, the classroom was packed because it was something you automatically did. But we immediately perceived the fact that those of us who were interested in learning about the Catholic uh, faith were no longer uh, uh, personae gratae any longer. <laughs> that the ones who uh, were totally contemptuous of it were the ones who were the favored figures. Wow, so, wow. Uh, so we, to quote Lenin, voted with our feet and we never went back again. And uh, this kind of thing happened immediately with a lot of people. A lot of people voted with their feet, and when they saw what was happening, just left. Many of them uh, uh, disturbed by things which were, which are intrinsically important, but are not uh, essential to uh, articles of faith. Like, for example, uh, large numbers of people stopped going to mass once it was no longer the case that you were not obliged. Uh, to avoid meat on Friday, because they said if we're not allowed, if we don't have to eat, if, if we can eat meat on Friday, therefore it means that there's no such thing as the Trinity as, as well. They just made this <laughs> wow. kind of yeah. judgments. So people fell off rather quickly, and then it stabilized a bit. Uh, but I, I, I found it. I, I, I always found going to this, this, um, this new mass rather uh, unpleasant. And then when I started as an undergraduate, I was lucky enough. Uh, to run into uh, two people, uh, quite different in character, but both of whom ended up confirming my uh, or or leading me down the path to the traditionalist movement. One of them was my history teacher, who himself was a young man at the time. He would have been uh, 1970. Would have been 28, um, and uh, he had already started going to the Roman Forum, which had been formed in 1968 by von Hildebrand in order to defend Humane Vitae and was meeting uh, regularly at this very, very large uh, uh, hall at Fordham University in the Bronx uh, and uh, having a, a monthly gathering, a gathering. So he said to me, I think you might be interested in coming to this. So I went to that meeting, uh, which was packed, and it was an eye opener. It was an eye opener because von Hildebrand um, was uh, an energetic presence uh, who needed, by the way, the help of his uh, second in command, Dr. William Mara from Fordham University, because his English would falter at times. And Mara would leap up and say, stand aside, Dietrich, I'll handle this one. Oh, really? <laughs> and describe things. Uh, and so what happened is that from that point on, I, 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 I was introduced into the circles that were um, aware that the problem was not just something that was connected with uh, with misinterpretations of Vatican II, but a, a kind of systemic problem um, that was affecting everybody. And then also uh, really bringing out of the woodwork 
people who uh, had entered into the clergy um, uh, and just gone along with what existed beforehand, but saw this now as an opportunity to give vent to their uh, perhaps hidden heresies uh, or, 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 or inclinations for, for a long time. So it was still possible to have a tr to find a traditional mass in 1970 um, and even into 71. Although a lot of people who uh, found that um, that was being cut off from them and it, it was effectively cut off uh, even in New York uh, by 1971, I would say there might have been one or two straggler places that still did it. A number of them, given the circumstances of where I live, um, were people who were able to go to one or the other of the um, of the Eastern Rite churches, which I did too, um, uh, since I I couldn't regularly by seventy one find a um, a traditional mass. I went off there and then became a a, a, a cantor for the liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom, which I've I've retained a passionate interest in as well. Um, so uh, it was, a, a, again, a period of everything being cut off. There's a mass flight from Catholic schools at the time as people who were concerned about uh, Orthodox matters began to see that uh, they were not being taught anything Orthodox in, in, in the school any longer. And with this was linked together, of course, the uh, collapse of the religious orders uh, the, the, uh, the, the sisters of various kinds were affected worse than the, the clergy and dropped out much more quickly, also because they were subjected to this uh, psychological, um, psychological pressure that many of them even invited in, um, uh, uh, conducted by people, many of whom have, have repented having been engaged in this activity. And so even the personnel of the schools that would have supported larger um, larger Catholic populations attending them were gone. Um, so it was uh, it was it was a, a, a battle. It was a battle, and uh, it was very very swiftly the case that you were treated as though you were a madman for wanting to stick with something. If you think of let's say um, 1973 when I graduated from uh, uh, from from uh, uh, university with my BA, uh, ten years ago I'd been confirmed in something that. None of us who were confirmed had the faintest idea was under threat of changing. Ten years later, you were treated as a freak uh, for having any continued interest in any of these matters at all. So that's what the joy of it was like. People who were younger um, than me at that time period, like, for example, when I met Dr. Mara um, at the Roman Forum, he already uh, in 1970 had set up a homeschooling network and they had their uh, their. Uh, they're, they're, uh, at the time, they were called Holy Innocent Schools. Uh, they had their little network, but the people who were going to them from Catholic families who were uh, eager to maintain the faith, um, I, I remember that uh, his children used to hide uh, in the, uh, on the ground of the back seat of the little truck that they had in order to uh, 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 get by the school authorities who might be on the lookout for who were being truant in order to make their way to their wow. uh, rented rented space, which was almost invariably in a Protestant uh, a Protestant church that allowed them to rent out the basement for their purpose. Unbelievable! <laughs> wow. I, so I mean that that just gives a, a picture for a minute uh, to people who people who are so frustrated with the tradition of custodis, and you know they're uh, I, I try to I try to tell people like you know it, yeah things are bad. But uh, what was it like in 1970? Is it? It's. It seems to me, Doctor Doctor Rout, you tell me if I'm wrong. It seems to me that we have Trinidad Sinos Custodes, and we have uh, we have a whole book edited by Kraszewski on on bishops, cardinals, priests, and scholarly laymen all opposing traditional Sinos right. Custodes. Right. And we've got a worldwide movement of of traditional Latin masses. Uh, Seventy percent of bishops have done absolutely nothing to implement traditional casotas. They've just continued the, the good status quo of, right. of Simona Pontificum, basically. So it seems to me that there, there's a black and white difference between what you what you personally faced in 1970 and what you face today. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Uh, in in, in uh, the 1970s, the idea that we would ever have had, uh, first off, uh, 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 Ecclesia Dei, uh, and then Samorum Pontificum, 
would have seemed like a, a, a pipe dream. And right now, I mean, I can tell anybody listening to this, I don't have the faintest fear in, at, at all that anything is going to come of this 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 latest attack. I don't have the faintest fear at all. This is just a kind of a kind of nuisance um, that um, that will will go away. I mean, we're we 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 historically histor I don't mean to say that there's no struggle. There is a struggle, and this struggle is getting is getting uh, in some respects uh, worse. Um, but historically speaking, uh, viewing things that I've seen happen in the past, from my standpoint, we've already won. It's just a question of these people not recognizing that as of yet. Um, but then putting it into the more um, in, in intensely uh, 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 dangerous circumstance of the, of the broad picture and the life of the church and society as a whole right at the moment. Um, another cause for my uh, sharing Mike Matt's uh, joy of living at this time period is that Nothing is hidden any longer. Everything is as crystal clear as could possibly be. Uh, the satanic character of uh, the, um, the dominant forces in every aspect of life today, um, in the church, in the state, in society at large, um, in the educational community, which has no right to exist any longer uh, because of the fact that it does nothing systemically uh, to promote what it is supposed to exist for. All of it is so crystal clear. Um, it's um, it's much, much easier than uh, than than uh, than uh, fighting in the 1970s ever was. Um, I mean, my old age is proving to be a springtime for me. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. So, so tell tell us about um, the what's out right now with Aruka. Let me just uh, I'm going to put this on the screen here. So, here's Volume One for the Whole Christ, mm -hmm. Catholic Christendom versus Revolutionary Disorder. You also and you, you also have this delightful Catholic <laughs> cautionary calendar. So, tell us about these these works as, as to what uh, what readers can find here. Well, I mean, the, the Catholic, let me just start off with the calendar, because uh, there was one, uh, I'm trying to think who it was who mentioned this to me in the past, but uh, there, was, there was some friend of mine uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, my deepest, darkest path, past who, who reminded me that whenever you have a moment of, um, of confusion as to what it is that you should be doing, you should always uh, doodle uh, with something that you have around you just to have fun with it. And I can't even remember what the moment was where I was uh, probably a moment of, 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 of concern for the continued survival of the Roman form or something like that. But I was, I was upset about, about uh, something or other, and I couldn't get my mind wrapped around doing something academically serious. So what I did was I decided to put what I um, uh, what I, I thought was important about describing the entire growth of modernity into this rather whimsical calendar form. So what that calendar book does, it, it is whimsical, um, and a, a lot of the um, the phrasing in there is whimsical. But what it, it does is it does pursue a serious goal, and the serious goal is from uh, January to December. Uh, through all of the seasons, through all of the different weeks of the year, uh, to uh, divide that all up into a discussion of how the entirety of the situation that we live in right now developed from its roots already in the Middle Ages. All right. So it, it's a calendar year, um, but it's a calendar year divided up into uh, different seasons explaining how we moved from a kind of foundation of the secularized world that we live in now through its uh, its gradual unveiling and then its um, its ultimate uh, manifestation of all its absolute absurdities, which is what we <laughs> what we are living through um, right now, um, where you can't uh, you can't even um, you you couldn't have even made up uh, the fact that people are saying the things that they are now without being ashamed of, uh, of, of, of opening their mouths at all. And then volume one of the seven volumes, uh, as to uh, why um, uh, Alex picked uh, putting that volume out first, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not quite certain. It might have been just that it, it, it was the most cohesive of the lot. What he did there was he, he picked out the material 
that I've worked on, which is, is most concerned for demonstrating the entire political, social, moral, um, revolutionary character of, um, of, of, of modernity, not necessarily the specific theological aspects of it, uh, but more, more um, uh, holistic uh, problems that affect every aspect of, of, of life. And I think that in some of those articles that are in this particular volume, you can find, once again, in streamlined form, uh, the kind of argument that I presented in the Black Legends book about, once again, the development of this grand coalition of the status quo as well. Yeah, I, and I'm glad you had uh, the Louis Vio uh, <laughs> article because uh, as a as a layman and a publisher, I I sort of try to take my cue from Vio to capture some of do some of the good things that he did in, in his own time. But as well, you well, say, yeah, well, he, you are you are doing what it is. Well, thank you. you. Tried you by your prayers, but uh, but, I mean, he's a misunderstood the, figure, and I'm glad you oh, wrote that article. Yeah, uh, he's, because... he's just a delightful, a delightful <laughs> yes. um, a summarizer of the problems as well. I mean, I don't know if you looked at one of the articles there. There's one article that I wrote, I, I think, very early on. I think it was maybe when I just started at university about him and uh, his 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 depiction of what is happening and what is coming uh, is something that immediately came to my mind. Um, in the midst of of, of the whole lockdown um, uh, uh, fury, and then also the discovery of the collusion of all of these various forces around the World Economic Forum, uh, because it, it's in uh, Vrio is one of the people he and his his buddy from La Civiltà Cattolica Taparelli Bazzelio, they they are uh, the two people who uh, very much influenced me early on in seeing how. These elements uh, ideologically of what form the whole Marxist vision um, and and the, um, the 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 materialist aspects of uh, the the whole uh, sort of global uh, liberal capitalist uh, vision come together to produce uh, the same revolutionary goals and collude with one another and work with one another in a way that is just you know. The I's and the T's of, of this are dotted on everything at those hideous meetings in Davos every year. Right. It, it's quite remarkable how you bring out the seeds of what we're dealing with now in the 19th century counter-revolutionaries and how they're already seeing yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and, and I love this, this. The calendar, this is especially a really good text for anybody who uh like an introductory text you know this is a, a shorter word 136 pages but it has a little daily reading schedule and what i love about it as you say it's it's just mocking the forces of evil uh it's ridiculing their ridiculousness and uh it, it's just let's let's have a little fun here let's if we don't right. laugh we'll cry here sort right, of thing, right. you know? i mean it's essential i mean it's essential for us to do that it's it's their side that lacks humor. And that's, of course, more <laughs> manifest these days than ever before. Uh, it's 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 just it's just mind boggling again, the uh, uh, the lack of humor. But, you know, um, uh, in this regard too, to emphasize the, the fact that uh, that, uh, as Mike Matt has said, uh, we live in uh, from our standpoint, happier times in this regard. Uh, in the course of the last few years in my neighborhood here in lower Manhattan, I, we've become uh, a group of us much, much more tightly knit, and I've seen I've seen a number of people who um, who uh, told me that they have spent their entire lives being committed to the entire uh, liberal progressive vision of things. I've seen a number of them after having witnessed the madness of the anti scientific science emphasis of the COVID uh, uh, maniacs. Um, uh, have the scales fall away from their eyes so much so that they have now become um, uh, quite rabid in their hatred of everything liberal right down to the core. Uh, there's one woman that I know, a uh, very delightful woman that I know, who went from, uh, as she said, committed liberalism to then attending the conference that I, I ran in Long Island um, in 2021, we called it our Gardonian Exile Conference on the history of the traditionalist movement. She came, was absolutely delighted with everything wow. she heard and everyone she met. 
Wow, that that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I it's a really great good out of evil that uh, the the reality of what democracy in terms of its its vulgar form of democracy right. in the modern period really has always been since the very beginning of the American Revolt, Revolution, the French Revolution, all these various revolutions. They've always been these word merchants right. uh, in the pay of these elites right. who are stirring up the masses to bloodshed in the name of liberty. And right. then they're enslaved more than they were before as a right. result. Right. And, um, and where, where democracy should count, which is namely, let's say, for example, neighbors um, in a given quarter of a city wanting to protect and do as a group what they need to do to protect their neighborhood. That's the last thing that the uh, paladins of democracy consider to be <laughs> valid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what, what would you say, Dr. Rao, to the, the younger traditionalist generation, uh, maybe some of these trads who are particularly bitter and angry and hating Pope Francis to some excessive degree because right. of traditionalist custodes and they're wallowing in despair and you know, so they, they, their bishop took away their Latin mass. I don't, they don't, they don't have a Latin mass anymore. They have to go to the Novus Ordo or the Eastern Rite or something. What would you say to trads like that? Well, I mean, first off, just on a general spiritual level, bitterness can never be the fruit of the Holy Ghost. You know, it's got to be go. peace. Amen. It's got to be peace. And so if what's happening is that uh, the entire uh, spirit that you're developing is one of bitterness, then you have to step back and say there's something wrong there. Um, it's understandable that you have righteous anger at uh, being deprived of the uh, uh, the possibilities of having a, uh, the mass that one wants to attend around. And therefore, the righteous anger has to be aimed at just trying to find ways to get something somewhere, even if it needs to be to begin with what we had to endure in the 1970s, which was have, having masses at private homes or, uh, you know, in a hotel room where you had to you had to go to uh, start these things off. But uh, I would not. Uh, despair is under no circumstances what it is to be uh, anything to be to be cultivated in, in these days. Um, the, um, the 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 whole vision globally of what's happening has to be taken into account, as, as, as difficult as that is. And there is an easier way to deal with these problems today than there was certainly when I started in this movement in the 1970s. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have the ability to communicate with one another uh, readily uh, as people do now. Um, there's much, much greater access to a knowledge of what's happening uh, in dioceses around the country and around the world in a way to give the one clear, clear hope about the fact that if there are problems locally right at the moment, that they um, they will be overcome um, in the future. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that I thought, um, not just with respect to church issues, but other issues about the um, the 20th century as a whole, was that it seemed to me that one of the virtues that uh, people in the 20th century had to develop perhaps more than people ever before was uh, uh, the, the virtue of, of, of understanding the humor um, in the midst of all of the despair um, that the, uh, the, the 20th century dumped uh, into people's laps uh, uh, a plenty uh, because of the fact that um, it's always necessary to be able to see that human aspirations are defeated by human failings no matter what age it is that that you live in, um, but but again, in particular, uh, there was I think uh, there is I think a necessity for people who are suffering right at the moment to just um, put it in a little perspective and see that uh, what those of us who had to endure the first assault on the traditional order of things in uh, the 1960s and 70s in the church had to put up with was worse than this. And it's it's necessary to uh, use that as a um, as a means of being able to bolster your spirits. Now, um, it's this this what we're going through right now is 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 a passing phenomenon. What I would urge them to do uh, is to, uh, especially since with these tools of the internet, and even in local areas where people are deprived uh, of, of 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 a large number of uh, of of um, uh, fellow travelers here. Uh, what they've got to do more than ever before is cultivate friendship with one another. Um, love the brotherhood. 
Yes. You know, love love the brotherhood. The, love the, fear God, love the brotherhood, cultivate the brotherhood. Because, because all of us are in need of, of sound, sound, um, uh, humored, good humored, uh, militant friendship in these days. I would say um, obey the king as well, if we want to continue the biblical reference here, except that unfortunately we don't have much in the way of models, but I do see one behind you in your library on the, oh, wall, yes, right yes. now, uh, on the wall right now. And, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the memory and the model of these people is something also, and the suffering of these people is something also that I think is a, a, a good, good um, tool for people who are suffering uh, the more immediate uh, difficulties of, uh, of, of spiritual support as well. Um, it seems to me that one, one distinction that I got reading Dietrich von Hildebrand in one of his apologetics regarding Vatican II was that there seems to be a huge disconnect between those who deal with this whole crisis on a very theological, theological and theoretical level Right. They're, they've got their PhDs and they're in, a, they're in a conference room, 21 stories above ground or whatever, and they're discussing theology or whatever in okay. theory. Right. And then there's a whole nother historical reality in terms of what's happening on the parish level, what's happening with the liturgy and the parish level. And it seems to me uh, people, you know, people can talk about, oh, Vatican II is theologically correct on this exact point or whatever. Right. But when when the rubber meets the road, you have the hotshot Jesuit who comes into town and quotes Vatican II and, and empties out the church. And I think this right. is particularly true when we talk about Archbishop Lefebvre, because people criticize Archbishop Lefebvre and his society for breaking a bunch of ecclesiastical rules. Mm -hmm. And as Catholics, we certainly care about ecclesiastical order and there should be order. And this is serious, you know, as you, you know, we should have a hierarchy and all this. But I think the critics of the SSBX don't realize what was actually going on in the 1970s. What right. kind of insane nonsense was going on with sacramental validity or not? All, right. all sorts of liturgical abuse. We hear about liturgical abuses, but what I've heard about what was going on in the 70s is even worse than what we deal with. So oh. can, can you speak at all to that kind of distinction? People who are oh, kind yeah. of, they just don't understand the history of what was actually happening, which you lived through. Right. Well, I mean, again, this is this is something which is hugely important to begin with. You cannot understand uh, the whole Catholic message and you cannot understand what you have to do uh, as a Catholic. If what you do is you, um, you, you deprive yourself of one of the two lungs that you need. And the two lungs that you need are both speculative theology and positive theology. And speculative theology is uh, uh, the theology that then utilizes the tools of logic and of philosophy in order to then take the, the data of revelation and, um, and then, uh, uh, in a sense, draw from it what it is that the human mind can, um, can uh, cooperate with revelation to help to explicate the faith. Um, but but it doesn't pure speculative theology give you an indication of what's actually happening with the troops on the ground. And positive theology, in addition to involving just the, um, the actual data of, um, of, uh, of Scripture, let's say, the written data of Scripture, is what comes from the whole tradition, the whole tradition, which you understand by looking at the whole history of the church. By looking at the councils, by looking at what it is that people have done, the battles that they've had to fight in order to try to define doctrine, uh, maintain a commitment to orthodoxy through the ages, defend the church uh, from from its enemies, and um, it's it's one thing. Let's say, for example, to plunge into a particular era era and say, "Oh, look, they're saying all the right things." You know, they're saying all the right things. Everybody is is saying what it is that church doctrine is um, and then not look at the positive data of the history of the era and then see that all of the uh, saying of the right things is going in one ear and out the other and people are paying no attention to them in practical reality. Um, it's something which uh, is required. Uh, in order to be able to see what's really, really going on, you gotta, you gotta see that there are uh, many errors in the past history of the church in which uh, the doctrine seems firm, but the actual practice of it is at a total disconnect 
from what the reality is. It's one thing spouting off what it is that canon law is. It's another thing obeying it. Um, and, um, and any look at history will demonstrate that there's often wide, wide gaps between what the reality is in terms of practice and then the, um, uh, the, the, the formal statements of things. But if you take it to the immediate uh, present, and then I'll give you a couple of examples of what really happened um, at the moment, um, just to take a, a, a secular matter, I mean, if you tried to understand what was happening in the Soviet Union, in the 1930s, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, by reading the Stalin Constitution of the 1930s, you'd have no idea what was going on. I mean, this wonderful freedoms everywhere. So, <laughs> so what's world, it? utopia. Yeah. yeah, so you could have somebody go off to the gulag and read the passages of the Stalin Constitution and say, you see, you live in a model society. And yet what's happening is that you're, uh, you're, 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 you're being tortured. All right. And it's the same thing with Vatican II. I mean, to quote a, a very good friend of mine um, from the SSPX, he's always telling people that he's happy to have a public debate uh, with them over who actually pays attention to more of Vatican II. Uh, because uh, if you look at the documents of Vatican II, pure documents, um, you, can, you can agree with most everything. There are gaps. That's where the problem comes in, because when you see what's said compared to what was said before or how it's said, then you've got difficulties that emerge. Uh, but but in terms of what's said, I mean, there's a vast amount that um, that is um, that is that is perfectly acceptable. It reminds me, I'm just giving these lectures on the last year on, on the years of Pope Benedict and uh, at the time of Pope Benedict's trip to Germany in 2011. Um, there's a um, there's a statement that's made by all of these uh, all of these uh, theologians in Germany uh, underneath the heading we will remain silent no longer and I think Benedict said when did they ever remain silent <laughs> you're talking about <laughs> people but they talk about you know the fact that the council has been derailed but they're in disagreement with almost everything that the council said. That, that is in, in any kind of union with past, past tradition. The reality has been utilizing the gaps in Vatican II uh, or the manner in which the, uh, the, the teachings are presented to, de to destroy um, the faith, which is what the goal of a number of the people who were involved in, in, in the whole picture to begin with uh, were interested in anyway. But I mean, to go back to the actual practice, to go out back to the actual practice, there were when when I was um, first involved with this movement, there were there were good you know good number of people um, among the Episcop uh, in the episcopacy who were saying you know correct things. I mean certainly certainly uh, uh, a number of the bishops in New York were saying good things, correct things about doctrine. But meanwhile, all of the underlings were destroying everything around them, destroying right. everything around them, and. Um, uh, when I was, uh, I, I remember when I first discovered the real problem, and this was even before I got involved with the traditionalist movement. This is in the the late '60s. I remember the first thing that I would find is I would I'd go go to confession, right? I'll just give you a few examples. I go to confession, and I uh, walk into the confessional, and uh, I'd say things, and then the priest would tell me, "Well, that's not a sin any longer. What you've just confessed is not a sin any longer." So I said, well, it was a sin last year. How come it's not a sin this year? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not a sin any longer. In one case, particular case I can remember in those early days, and this is right after the council, really right after the council. I, I, I go there. I confess my sins. Uh, the priest doesn't give me absolution because nothing I had done was a sin. So I get out. And in those days, there were still a number of priests here in confession in the same church. So I went across the aisle, the other side of the aisle. I said, bless me, Father, it's been two minutes since my last confession. <laughs> and I, I, I said, um, I explained to him what happened. And I, he just went, can you just go through everything from start to finish again? So on his side of the aisle, it was still a sin. On the other side of the aisle, it was no longer a sin. Oh, um, wow. I remember going, I mean, confession was the worst. That was the worst in those days, in the late 60s, in the early 70s. Uh, I remember going to uh, this one uh, confession. It, it was an evening confession time, and it was, the, it was in the winter, so it was dark. And I went into this rather dark church, 
and walked into the confessional and realized, because there still were confessionals at that time, there was no grill. And there was just this face lit up that I had to endure of the priest there. And I remember the image that came into my mind was the, the ghostly figure in the film, The Seventh Seal, the, the sort of uh, devilish figure who was there. And he looked at me and said, it is good that we are here. And I thought it's oh. not good that we are here <laughs> at all. And in this particular church, this particular church was a very with it, renewed church. Oh, and boy. one of their signs of renewal was to pull the central pillar out of the entrance of the main door to the church at Easter so that the priest could drive a Volkswagen into the church from which he was shouting, renew, renew, renew. And it was a new Volkswagen. So that's why oh, I mean, oh, wow. I mean, that thing you found, I mean, regularly, regularly. Um, I wrote a novel um, to describe all of the problems of the destruction of the world around me, uh, which is called Periphery. I have it on the internet. It's got certain sections which are a little risque because I had to describe modern phenomenon. But there's one about the problems of the church, which I think I called the chapter, The Acts of the Apostles. And it's okay. about all the different um, sectarian developments that took place uh, from when I was a child onwards. Um, and so they're all recounted there in full detail. Well, yeah, because this, this is... Okay, this because this is a historical problem is that we need to have a, a, a an immense historical work detailing. You oh, kind of yeah. get this in, um, you, you get some of this in in Archbishop of the Fev's book, uh, Letter to Confused Catholics. He goes through and a lot Michael of these stories, and Michael Davies recounts all sorts of incidents like this. Okay, okay, and that's just is that throughout Michael Davies' work or in, in particular? His trilogy, work out? In, in his oh, the trilogy, trilogy, yes. Okay, we've got that right next to Blessed Emperor Carl right there. <laughs> yeah, no, he's. He goes into all of the horrid detail of the hurling rosaries at you. This is ridiculous for you to pray these things any longer. Uh, hurling rosary, de denying one doctrine after another after another um, uh, in front of you. I mean, it was it was just really hellish, <laughs> the whole thing. I'm looking at uh, where can we buy periphery? I've got I found the free version. You, you can't. There is none. Oh, um, OK, it's, it's on my website. It's on my website, and if you see it, there's a description of what it's all about at the beginning, and then it has, as an illustration of where I'm going, John Lennon's Imagine. Yeah, I've, I've got uh, – uh, so I'll put that on the link as well, so people if you, yeah. if you want to read the novel on his website. Yeah, but there, but there is a little warning about the fact that there is some risque language in parts right. of it because, uh, because I was so – it was a period when I was really, really um, angry at everything. Uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's understandable. So we've got a few more minutes. Tell us about what is happening with the Roman Forum. You, there's an article below you can read about what is the Reform, Roman Forum, a little bit of the history, what's happening with Gardone this year. Tell us about that. Well, Gardone this year, we've got a, a good solid packed house. We'll have about 70 people. I don't like to take more than that. It becomes a problem for logistic reasons. And we've got... Um, fantastic array of international speakers more than ever before. And the topic that we focused on and really suggested more than anything else by the, 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 uh, the problem of transhumanism and of posthumanism, which is at the center also of what these, these, these globalist madmen are doing um, in, um, in Davos and the World Economic Forum. And so the topic is, uh, is, is uh, the church and paganism old and new. Um, so we've got speakers on all different aspects of this. And what I have also, I think, on that uh, a sheet that you're showing right now uh, uh, was the initial tentative faculty. Some of the people there can't come, and there are a number of others who, who are coming. Um, but it's going to be a very, very grand, grand event. The thing that is becoming difficulty, let me get rid of, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, the thing that I... Um, uh, I'm concerned about for the future is the entire global political and economic situation, because it is uh, becoming, you know, very, very difficult financially to have this kind of grand event uh, because of the raise in prices. And for the American uh, contingent coming, that's been most reflected by the enormous raise in, in, in air costs this year. A lot of people are using points in order to be able to come. So we're all, you know, we're continuing to plan for the future. 
Um, and we're always a welcome presence. And by the way, here as well, there's been no difficulty utilizing the parish church for um, for uh, traditional masses. Um, and um, then in New York, we have our New York program where I think, we, as we mentioned at the beginning of the talk here, we're coming to the end of 31 years of lectures on church history. And it's no longer history any longer when you reach tw even the period I'm dealing with now is, is more current events than anything else. But I don't even have the heart to go behind beyond 2013 in terms of a church history program. So we're going to try to uh, we're going to do something else. All right. OK. Um, the future. We're going to try to do something else in the future. Uh, what it is, I don't know quite yet. I'm trying to figure it out in my own head what it might be. And it's also connected with world events because uh, because we realize that um, we, we have to engage militantly in what's happening at the moment. Uh, do we have one minute more that I can explain something? Oh, certainly. Can... Yes. Yeah. yes, certainly. Go ahead. I, I was just, just for viewers' sake and listeners, I, I, I'm showing on the screen right now the, the entire archive of Roman Forum lectures oh, that okay. are on SoundCloud. So that'll be linked below as well. You can follow the link to this whole archive as well. Oh, wonderful. That's really good. No, I just came back from giving two lectures on, um, uh, on, on St. Robert Bellarmine. And, um, and it, what was interesting about the lectures for me, because I haven't gone over material like this for a while, is how much uh, the whole career of Robert Bellarmine reflects what we're trying to do at the Roman Forum. Because he was a man as a Jesuit um, who was engaged militantly in, in well, his position was that of th uh, uh, polemical theology. Uh, he was a man engaged militantly in immediate issues, but his understanding of what it is that needed to be done and the, the understanding really of the, 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 the Jesuits as a whole, at least at the time period, was that that militant engagement had to be founded on sound knowledge and sound knowledge, once again, with the two lungs of the church, speculative theology and positive theology of full knowledge so that one uh, knows that when he uses the word traditionalist, that it's not just a kind of banner to justify whatever it is that uh, a given person might be particularly attached to, but that it really is the full tradition of the church that you're defending. This was of concern to me when I started the whole church history program. Are we really defending the full tradition of the church or just some hobby horses? that we're most focused on. And the best way for us to be able to understand this is to go through the whole tradition. So in effect, what I decided I needed to do was to take my friends along with me on a 31 year journey through church history, the whole tradition, and have a good time with it while we were doing it, um, which we have done. And once again, we've built up a, a fine brotherhood as a result of all of this. and. Um, have you know linked up with um, with people who like yourself are doing this work in a, a on a level that we could never have dreamed of doing it when we first started uh, getting into this picture. Well, it's it's certainly a legacy of Dietrich von Hildebrand because he was always uh, creating community with discussion right. groups at his house, both in uh, Munich and in uh, Vienna when he left went there. And and then when he came to America, he was always creating community and then the community together could face these issues together. I think that's what that's one of the things that I love what you emphasize, the importance of traditionalists loving the brotherhood. There, there's there's a lot of bitterness even among trads, unfortunately, trad against trad, friendly fire. You know, it's like. Let's I know, and, they, yeah. and just, to, and just to, to love to love life as a whole, because that's what you know, that's what. This is all. This is what it's meant for me. When people come along and say, "Oh, how can you be part of that religion which is so restrictive?" I don't know what they're talking about because this is what's given me my joy in life in every regard, from 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 food up until a desire for eternal life together with God. So <laughs> there we go. Well, that's a perfect perfect way to end this this conversation, Doctor Rao. Thank you so much for your time today. Once again, everyone, go buy uh, Doctor John C. Rao's books. You will not be disappointed. The, the, it, your your hum, your good humor and whimsical joy is matched by your erudition. 
and, <laughs> and your penetrating analysis. And that's oh. a perfect combination. Something well, I, I, I don't always have the good humor or the erudition. And so I, I love to learn from you, Dr. Rao. So um, I really appreciate your time today. With that, let's let's offer everything to our lady uh, under her icon that we we are promoting one of our projects here at one beer five is promoting this icon which is the russian catholic icon of fatima and the good news is in the month of may we just got the news that this icon will be available for purchase we just we just uh are partnering with uh some allies in the trad movement to get this icon available for purchase so that people can buy this icon for their own devotional purpose but also support the building of the Shrine of Fatima in St. Petersburg, Russia. And this is also an effort to help our Ukraine, both Ukrainian Catholic and Russian Catholic brethren in the struggle that they're dealing with right now in the Ukrainian crisis, but also as a part of the larger Fatima crusade for Fatima. Um, and then next month, we're also going to have uh, more pushes on our Eucharistic reparation crusade, also under the banner of Fatima. So with all that, Let's offer up a Hail Mary and we'll invoke our three patrons here at 1 Peter 5. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl. Pray for us. Saint Maximilian Kolbe. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen.